Connor O'Gara joining us on the 1st of August. I mean, the way that I'm seeing the reaction on social media and from people, August 1st needs to be a holiday for the, essentially like the start of college football season in a sense. Connor, are you celebrating today? I'm celebrating. I'm celebrating because, yes, college football is back. My cousin's birthday is August 1st. I remember as a kid thinking that when her birthday came around, that was dangerously close to back to school time and i hated that but as an adult who no longer has to go to school no big deal i find myself very excited when august 1st comes around because it means that we get we get college football this month we don't get sec football this month we get big 10 football in ireland which is going to be fun but august 1st is a great day i don't know that it's quite holiday worthy but it's certainly one of the better non-football days of the year when are we going to get an sec team going out to play Somewhere internationally. Not, it doesn't have to be Ireland. I mean, you could, take, you could get uh, Alabama's. Alabama never worries about going on the road and playing somewhere that's a non, uh, that's a, not a home or road game as a neutral site. But they're kind of getting away from that right now. Wouldn't you like yeah. to see an SEC team play like in Europe? Well, Florida's going to Utah. That's practically a foreign country. <laughs> Hasn't Europe, spent right. time there this past month. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, baby steps here. It, the SEC rarely leaves its footprint for a, a true road game or anything like that. Uh, so I, I wouldn't necessarily hold my breath on that. But at the same time, I think what, what's really interesting now is in the latter half of the decade, we're going to be getting away from all this neutral site stuff. We're, we're still going to have some of these, but... The, look at some of these future schedules for Alabama, Georgia, Florida, these teams that have really loaded up the Power Five non-conference home and home. College football fans, we, we can talk about how much the, the, the playoff and the expansion frustrates us. That is one of the positives of, the, of an expanded playoff, which I now expect to happen since the Alliance is dead, is that these non-conference games are, are going to be really, really good. I, I mean, I, I love the fact that we're going to get to see Alabama play a true road game in non-conference play for the first time in a decade. I, I would rather see these teams playing in actual college venues. No offense. I mean, there are some great neutral site games, but I just think that's better to be able to watch. I, I'm looking forward to watching a neutral site game in Ireland, but... I'd still rather have these games on college campuses. Yeah, this because it's something new, and you want to see what the atmosphere is going to be like. I think we can all agree that the atmosphere on college campuses is better mm-hmm. than they are like in NFL stadiums for college games. You missed out on one team in the SEC that is also playing in Utah this year, Connor, and it's Arkansas. They're at BYU. Right. And it's amazing when you look. Like So Arkansas has, depending on who you read, the toughest schedule in the nation. We're kind of used to it here. They wear it as a badge of honor. But they don't have a single non-conference game that is a Power 5 opponent. I mean, you get two that are going to be joining the Big 12, Cincinnati and BYU. Then there's Liberty, a really good independent program, and Missouri State, one of the better FCS programs. So it's it's it's, it's funny to, to read, and I agree with you. I want to see more SEC versus other Power 5. Hogs have maybe the toughest schedule in the SEC, and yet they're not playing anybody out of the SEC that's Power 5. I'm old enough to remember when Chad Morris having a non-conference schedule that did not include a single Power 5 team was supposed to help him instead of hurt slash embarrass him. <laughs> Look, I, Sam Pivot, different story. Um, I, I think it will be, even though those are some tricky non-conference games. I'm pretty sure BYU leads the country in that great stat that Bill Connolly puts together every single year, percentage of returning production. So obviously... Hawk fans shouldn't be sleeping on that one. A trip to Provo is going to be a lot of fun. The views there are immaculate. But, yeah, is that still a a byproduct of that Michigan home-and-home getting canceled? Am I I correct in assuming that? Oh, man, I think that it might have had something to do with it. Uh, That was uh, Colorado State was to cover up Michigan, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, but, uh, man, I don't know. I don't know if the BYU home-and-home had – had. it's to do with both of those games or just one of those games? I'd have to read back on that. Yeah, it's crazy how that's turned out, though, because I, I think you would look at that non-conference schedule and see a Cincinnati team that has a ton of production to return, but still, a Cincinnati team that was just in a college football playoff that's coached by Luke Fickle is still a really good football team. And I, I think that you would look at all those different elements and say, yeah, Arkansas has a really loaded schedule this year. And I, I think that's kind of why some of the – the preseason optimism with them has been, 
I think it's been a, a little bit dialed down from what I initially expected. And when you actually start, you know, mapping out how some of these games are going to go, we do our crystal ball series every single year with Saturday down south. That'll be starting, I think, August 15th. I got to check with my editor to make sure when I got to have those things ready to go. But when you actually have to pick every single SEC game and you realize, oh, man, it, Seven and five is a lot more realistic for some than, than mm. nine and three. I, I think Arkansas is closer to the nine and three side because I think their defense is really going to keep them in, in a lot of these games. I think would have been more of a struggle last year, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it is always it, always, it is always kind of fun to think we have a certain idea of what these non conference schedules look like at this time of year, and we really don't know. No, we don't. But it's always fun to predict and to and and, and to give our best educated guests on it and. Hey, I'm sitting here looking at Saturday down south, and you dropped the best case scenarios for each team for literally right before, uh, at least from what it says on my computer, right before you joined us. Uh, Connor, and you've got the best case scenario for Arkansas at, at 10 and 2, which I don't think anybody would be upset about. I mean, and you, you even say that'd be a loss to Alabama and then at least one at BYU versus AM or at Mississippi State. If it's two state, though, I feel like that would be. The one out of those three that would be the most disappointing, though, right? Probably, um, just because that would be seen as like, oh, hey, you know, our stuff on a way to win that game last year. Um, uh, those games have been really competitive, though, in recent memory. And it, it, they, it does always come down to a play here or there. And you could argue that a certain pass interference call on you know, Traylon Burks got to go in his favor and might have dictated the results of that game. I, some would say that. I'm not one of those, but I understand what airways I'm on. Um, I think that is kind of best case scenario for an Arkansas team that is looking to make that next step. Ten and two is that next step. If you get through the SEC West and that non-conference schedule, going ten and two and going to a New Year's Six Bowl, having what would be best season in Arkansas since 2011, that is a huge positive. And, and I, I don't necessarily think that all bowl games are created equal as Sam Pittman reminded us, you know, sometimes you can, you can have rings for bowl victories and, and that is perfectly okay. And you can do it just cause you want to do it. I think if Arkansas is standing in that position at season's end, double digit wins, feeling like it was positive overall, improve the brand of Arkansas football, maybe host the college game day uh, mm. game. I mean, is, is that, is that something that would include be included in the best case scenario? Probably. I think if all those things happened, and it felt like this program took another step forward, uh, Arkansas fans would be feeling really good, and they'd be feeling really good about that contract that Sam Pittman just signed. Oh, for sure. Now, I was also looking at um, your QB1 predictions from around the SEC, and one that kind of jumps out at me a little bit, because I've seen it so 50-50, is that you, you picked Altmaier uh, over Dart at Ole Miss. Why, why'd you give him the edge? I've done a 180 on this, and I was – one of those people that assumed Luke Altmaier had no chance of starting for Lane Kiffin whatsoever. And the more I thought about it, and you, you look at some of the basic factors at play here, the more you kind of realize, wait a minute, wait, why am I assuming that Jackson Dart is just automatically the guy? Am I assuming that because he's this highly coveted transfer who comes in from USC? Or am I also factoring in Luke Altmaier performing in relief in the Sugar Bowl against a Dave Aranda coach defense. Because if it's the latter, that's really dumb. And I think I discounted Luke Altmaier too much in the offseason early on, especially when the Jackson Dart news came out that Lane Kiffin was going to be adding him. Some would say, well, you know, if, if Jackson Dart's not going to be the guy, then why is Lane Kiffin add him? They had to get a quarterback no matter what. They lost Matt Corral to the NFL draft. John Rice Plumley was off to UCF. They didn't sign a quarterback in this most recent class as well. Their quarterback numbers were low. They were going to sign a quarterback from the transfer portal, even if Luke Altmaier came in, lit up Dave Aranda's defense in the Sugar Bowl. That didn't happen. He had a good third quarter. But then you kind of watch, the, you kind of listen to the way things have played out in the spring, the year advantage that he has in the system, which I think matters. Too many people think it's easy to be a Lane Kiffin quarterback, even though it's not. And I think seeing Jackson Dart kind of struggle in the spring game, you're reminded that this is, this is a true battle. And so I went out a little bit of a limb and said that Luke Altmaier is going to be the guy. Lane Kiffin doesn't have to worry about Jackson Dart transferring because he used up his one-time exemption. So, yeah, that's kind of why I headed in that direction. I think the experience is going to win out for somebody who has been considered a film junkie and somebody who has more experience in that offense. Mm -hmm. So we feel like uh, the defensive line uh, position battle is a really intriguing one and very important for Arkansas this year. Uh, if you can give me one non-quarterback 
SEC position battle that intrigues you, what would it be? How about receiver at Alabama? Is that is that too boring of a thing to say? Receiver Never. at Alabama and tight end at Georgia. Who earns those snaps? Who earns those significant looks? It's going to be fascinating. Now, obviously, you would expect Brock Bowers, tight end at Georgia, to dominate, but the the ability to work in other tight ends and how much, how many snaps Eric Gilbert's going to get over Darnell Washington, the true freshman Oscar Dell. They have four tight ends that would probably be considered the better, you know, one of the better tight ends in the SEC if they all got the start. But I, I think that that battle behind Brock Bowers is going to be really interesting. And then at Alabama, we saw it, you know, James Williams last year just became a revelation for that team. And you saw what happened when Bryce Young had that trust in him, even though they didn't even get a spring together. So my question moving forward is who steps into that lead role at Alabama? Do they become the next great Alabama receiver? Is it the transfer from Louisville, Tyler, uh, Tyler Harrell, who averaged like 28 yards a catch last year? Is it Jermaine Burton, the transfer from Georgia? Is it somebody who's been around at JoJo Earl? Are we going to see some of these guys step up and be those game changers that Alabama is just so used to having? I wouldn't necessarily say that any of them are locked into that role to be the next James Williams, but at the same time, I think there's just so much value in that. That's what we're probably going to be talking about a lot now. Partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's Wimbledon Finals, Major League Baseball, the latest fighting news, and even next season's early NFL futures. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code. B L E A V. That's B L E A V to get the bonus and get into the action. Bet online where the game starts.